Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight to um, hear about our presentation, Minimizing Risk, Maximizing Reward, um, Tips on How to Recreate Safely in Oregon's High Desert. My name is Renee Patrick, and I've been working to establish the Oregon Desert Trail for ONDA, the Oregon Natural Desert Association, for almost six years now. Uh, so in addition to hiking all 750 miles, hiking and paddling all 750 miles of our immersive backcountry route, I've also spent a lot of time exploring, hiking, um, just adventuring out in Eastern Oregon. So I think this presentation and conversation tonight is extremely important to have, not just for any adventures that you might take in Eastern Oregon, but really for any adventures you take anywhere that involves recreating in the backcountry. Tonight I am speaking to you from Bend, Oregon on lands traditionally and presently inhabited by members of the Wasco, Warm Springs, and Northern Paiute tribes. Onda's conservation work takes place on the traditional lands of the Northern Paiute, Wasco, Warm Springs, Bannock, and Shoshone tribes, and on lands currently managed by the Burns Paiute tribe and the Confederated tribes of the Warm Springs. We offer this land acknowledgement to raise awareness of indigenous presence and land rights. And now a little bit about the Oregon Natural Desert Association. ONDA exists to protect, defend, and restore Oregon's high desert wildlands, waterways, and wildlife. And we've been doing so since 1987. ONDA is a leader in conservation and played an instrumental role in protecting cherished landscapes, such as the Steens Mountain Wilderness, the Spring Basin Wilderness, and the Oregon Badlands Wilderness. With a community over 10,000 strong, ONDA defends public lands from threats, partners with public and private landowners to preserve natural values, and encourages the exploration of wild places, and also restores the lands and waters to give the desert creatures a place in which to thrive. Thank you for the many ways that you all support this critical work. Before we dive into the heart of the conversation, I want to welcome our co-hosts from the Mountain Shop. The Portland-based Mountain Shop has been providing the Pacific Northwest community with the best camping, hiking, and skiing equipment available since they opened their doors in 1937. They offer rental packages of high-end gear, demo equipment, quality equipment repair, and they are a key resource for our community of outdoor adventurers. The Mountain Shop carries a range of niche and local brands like Feathered Friends, Hyperlite Mountain Gear, Sea Leo Gear, and Six Moon Designs. It's currently running a season lease program for ski and Nordic equipment to give affordable access to those not ready to or unable to purchase new equipment. So check out the mountainshop.net for details. Also tonight, the Mountain Shop has donated a raffle goodie bag. Um, so during the talk, we'll pull a name at random from all of you who are here um, attending the talk, and we will announce the winner during the Q&A Q portion at the end of the presentation. So first, I want to introduce our speakers tonight. You'll be hearing from Stacy Boone, an accomplished Triple Crown hiker, experienced search and rescue volunteer, and owner of her own guiding company, Step Outdoors, based in Vermont. Stacy was hiking the Oregon Desert Trail when she sustained a debilitating injury in the Owyhee region and needed to call for help. We will hear more about her experiences and dive into her expert knowledge around assessing risk and making decisions when injury happens. Next, we have Thomas Quinones, who is a creative artist and avid bikepacker from Portland. Tomas was on a week-long bikepacking trip when he encountered a man in need of rescue. We will hear more from Tomas about that experience and what it was like from the rescuer side of the, an event like this. And spoiler alert, one of the most important takeaways we want everyone to leave with today is the knowledge that accidents can happen to anyone no matter the level of experience you have or don't have, 
So it's important to prepare and consider that possibility every time you head outside. So through the course of tonight, you will hear from different sides of an accident injury experience, discuss assessing the risk of your activities, talk about decision-making once an accident happens, cover some safety tips, and leave time for some Q&A at the end of the session. So as you're watching and listening tonight, if you have a question, please put them into the chat box and we will try to get to a few of those at the end. So the events you will hear about tonight take place in two areas that ANDA has been working in for decades. Um, and since this, focus, this presentation is focused on recreation, I'm gonna share a few trip ideas with you in each of these areas. On the day of Tomas's rescue, he was biking from the Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge, just over the border in Nevada, to the Hart Sheldon National Wildlife Refuge uh, in Southern Oregon. These areas were formed as wildlife refuges by President Roosevelt in the 1930s to protect important habitat for prong, pronghorn and other wildlife. These refuges and the land between is one of the largest intact sloths of sagebrush steppe remaining in the West, and in fact has been recognized as one of the six most critical areas to the health and long-term survival of the greater sagegrass. We put together a story map earlier this year, which highlights the importance of this area to wildlife, especially the pronghorn antelope, which happens to be the Oregon Desert Trail mascot. Um, so we'll follow up uh, with an email tomorrow with a few links of things we talk about today, including the story map. And if you're interested in getting out and doing some stewardship, we do have um, projects in the area. So we will make sure to let you know how you can get involved. So if you want to recreate in the Hurt Sheldon region, a few trip ideas uh, first for biking would include uh, the trip that Tomas was on, Oregon's big country route. And I know he'll touch a little bit more on that and we have a map of what that route looks like, um, but it's a great way to uh, travel a lot of those gravel roads and see the landscape. And if you like hiking, I might be biased, but I would suggest the Oregon Desert Trail, which does traverse the Heart Mountain National Antelope Refuge from south to north. Um, so you can enjoy the refuge through uh, the trail or a short side hike takes you to the top of Warner Peak, which overlooks the Warner Valley, which you're seeing on the screen right now. Or a more challenging hike would be to go through uh, DeGarmo Canyon, which is um, traverses from bottom to top uh, the range, the, the fault block mountain and comes out, out near Heart, Heart Mountain Hot Springs on the top and all the way down to the Warner Valley below. So it's kind of a more adventurous hike out there. Now, Stacy was about 80 miles into her planned through hike of the 750 mile Oregon Desert Trail in the Waihee Canyonlands region. This area is on the border with Idaho and Nevada, and it's one of the largest unprotected expanses of public land in the lower 48. ONDA has been working on this area in a variety of capacities for decades. And some current legislation is headed up by Oregon Senator Wyden that would protect more than 1 million acres of some of the most important ecological, cultural, and recreational resources in the area, which all means this is an amazing place to explore and see firsthand why some call it Oregon's Grand Canyon. Some trip ideas. No surprise, I'm gonna go back to the Oregon Desert Trail. So section 25 of our route goes from Leslie Gulch to Lake Owyhee State Park. Um, and if you don't mind hiking without trail and getting a more immersive backcountry experience, this is a fabulous way to see some really stunning sections of the, of the Owyhee region like Painted Canyon um, and some uh, touch some of the Honeycombs area. And if you like to boat, um, a popular rafting trip for folks is to go from Rome, the small community of Rome, to Birch Creek. Or if you're more of a flat water paddler, you could take a canoe, a sea kayak, or paddleboard to Lake Owyhee State Park and experience the incredible geology from the water. Okay, so on to the main event. 
Um, let's go to Stacy and Tomas to hear from different sides of the, an accident injury experience. Um, Stacy, I'll turn it over to you first to tell us about your experience with your injury. Hi, well, first off, um, thanks for everybody being here and thank you for the invitation to be a part of this presentation tonight. Um, I am a backpacker for almost 25 years. I started my first hike on the Appalachian Trail like many people do. I thought that would be a one and done and that was not the case at all. I now have over 20,000 backpacking miles on my feet and I love the outdoors. I love the wildlands. I love the experience, um, the thrill that you get from being outside. For the last 11 years, I've owned Step Outdoors, which is a backpacking guide company. Up until a year ago, we were based in Colorado. So the goal and the focus of the business was to give people the knowledge, the skill set, and the confidence so that they could spend time outside. Now, my husband always made fun of me for running my own company because what I was doing was actually introducing more people to be in the landscape. But really what I wanted them to do was to do it safely and to do it responsibly because you have a much better experience when you know what you're getting yourself into. And if you have a good experience and you have a knowledge set, then you're more apt to go out there again. Well, what I decided to do is after having a few years of no through hikes, I decided that I wanted to start the Oregon Desert Trail. And I was thrilled about this opportunity. It is such a diverse trail. It's a hard trail. It's um, something beyond the scope of what many people can do. But I also wanted to do it old school style. I didn't want to grab an app like Gut Hook and put that on my phone and follow myself as a dot. I literally wanted to use the map and compass that I had based upon the maps that the Oregon um, Desert Trail Association has available. And I wanted to make my, myself get from point A to point B by relying on these skills. Now I've taught these skills for a lot of years with clients. Um, and it's always an amazing feat to me every single time you reach a point and you're like, this stuff really works. So that's what I learned once again is that using my map and compass skills work. Now I wanna give a little caveat to when I started this hike. Um, I had decided to take a sabbatical from my business, Step Outdoors, and I had done that because I had this little inkling of a feeling that my time was due, that something was up. And this is one thing I want people to really understand is that things can happen for a good reason, a bad reason, or no reason at all. Accidents can happen to anybody and they can happen to people with the most experience. And I like to really, you know, make sure and pound that into your brains that are listening is that accidents can happen to anyone. So I went out on this trail, I write in my journal every night, I only make it 86.6 miles before kind of disaster happens. But it's interesting that in my journal, I kind of talk about how an event is going to take place. But what happens on the last morning is that I am got to drop down into the Jordan Creek. I get my compass out, and I know exactly where I need to go because at this point, I've done a lot of visual bearing. I'm having some problems with my compass, um, actually confirming where I want to go, even though I know where I want to go. And I did have a compass as a backup, and it would often tell me to go in a contrary direction from my compass. But what happened is I took my bearing that morning, I headed down towards the Jordan, Creek and I took another bearing and my compass sent me another direction. And then it sent me in another direction. And finally I decided I know exactly where I need to go. I have the lay of the land and I reached the top where the rim is of, and you can see that in the far point of this photograph here, that was where I peered over. Made it down, got myself to the Jordan Creek, I was actually carrying a set of five finger shoes, stopped there, put on my five fingers, 
put everything into my backpack so it would be nice and well protected. I was carrying a big orange trash bag with me just for river crossings. And I started heading into the creek. And you always angle upwards where you're going into a creek. And I started in and the footing just didn't feel quite right. So I stepped back out of the creek, reassessed, found a new location and crossed the creek. When I got to the other side of the creek, and if you'll notice in this photograph here, um, down by the creek, there's a little green spot where it looks like a rock is sticking out. I came out about right there and walking along marshy area, very hard to get footing and very simply tripped and fell. And there was one piece of volcanic feeling lava rock sitting exactly where my knee landed. I knew instantly that I had broken my knee. There's no way to not know that that is what happened. But nonetheless, I stood up, tried to take another foot step forward, just because you want to make sure, right? You want to know that you actually have broken your, your leg. And I fell down. What happened from then on was the will to live, because I'm in this canyon. You see where I'm at. There's no cell service. It is up to me and me alone to get out of this canyon until I can reach somebody that can rescue me. And I spent five hours climbing from that green spot up to the rim of the canyon. Um, the short and long of this story is five hours later, I get there, I send, I get a text, I get a one bar and I get a text and I send it to my husband telling him that I have broken myself and that I would like search and rescue to come and get me. Um, a considerable amount of time, a couple hours passes before I get a response for him and his response is copy. Um, Copy means what? In my case, I was like, are you sending help or are you not sending help? And that's how the rescue process started for me, for me from a search and rescue perspective. And I'll stop right there unless you want me to continue with other questions. I think that that's good. We can dive into what happened after um, in a few minutes. Uh, but let's hear from Tomas. Tomas, do you want to take us through what happened on your backpacking trip? Uh, yeah. Uh, thanks, Renee. Um, so my name is Tomas Quinones, and in 2019, I decided I wanted to take um, about eight to ten days to go ride the Oregon's big country route in southeastern Oregon. I had been to the Steens Mountain a couple times. And I just thought that the Albert Desert and the surrounding area was absolutely beautiful. So one day in June or July, I headed out there, started from the French Glen Hotel. And I had budgeted myself eight to 10 days to do this. But because it was just nonstop sunshine, no clouds and no shade, I just ended up riding uh, nonstop throughout the day and then setting up camp just before nightfall. Uh, as you can see from the, the route, I actually went over Steens Mountain, uh, kind of near the northern ridge. Um, that's about where I lost my pair of shoes that I had strapped to the back of my bike. So I ended up doing the entire route in my sandals, uh, which kind of threw me off a little bit. And I was very careful not to stub my toes or do anything that would uh, jeopardize my trip. Then I crossed over to the uh, Albert Desert down towards the Oregon Canyon Mountains. And then shortly after that, I crossed the Nevada border into Sheldon National Wildlife. At this point, it's about five days in, and I had counted maybe 12 people that I had seen uh, the entire time. In fact, there was even one day, I think I saw maybe one person. Um, got up that, uh, let's see, I think it was a Thursday morning. I got up and, I'm sorry, Friday morning, and, uh, just started on my way like every day, crossed over the Oregon border, crossed over the highway, uh, which I had only seen one vehicle the entire time, um, and it was just a big truck, and then kept heading north towards the Heart Mountain National Antelope Refuge. 
Uh, again, this is one of those days where I'm several hours into my ride and that moving vehicle in the distance was the only sign of life that I had seen uh, yeah. that day. And then at some point I saw some, some dust moving ahead and I had seen some cows because there's actually a lot of pastures around that area. And along my trip, I had actually seen several dead cows uh, just on the side of the road or along the, along the route because there's this predators out there, uh, mountain lions, um, and just the lack of water ends up killing up some cows. But going along this stretch of road, uh, I saw something in the road that I thought was a dead cow and was kind of getting ready to hold my nose. And as I got closer, I realized that there is somebody rolling around in the middle of the road. And granted, this road doesn't get really any traffic. Any tracks you see are probably days old. There was an abandoned ranch near the um, northern part of this road that people like to go to. But during my entire, I don't know, two or three hours I was on this road, I didn't see anybody else. But as I approached this guy, he really wasn't moving. Um, I stopped by him and asked if he was okay. I was just kind of mind blown at this point that there was no vehicle or backpack or any signage that this guy had like hiked himself out here. Um, it was just a very surreal, surreal moment. Um, he didn't really seem to responding. He groaned a few times. So trying to judge what I could do at this point, um, I had no cell phone signal, so I couldn't ask for help anywhere. Um, even climbing above that ridge, I would not have been able to call anybody or send a text. So looking north, I did see some more movement, which looked like a vehicle or somebody on an ATV. Uh, so I rode a couple miles north, not seeing anybody and realizing that the smoke that I saw or the, the, the dust rising in the distance was actually another group of cows. I decided that the best course of action at that point would be to hit my spot tracker. Uh, which is a one-way satellite communicator that just basically calls for, for help. Uh, I hit the SOS on it, uh, which is under a little flap there. I've never used it for more than just checking in with my partner and my friends. Uh, so I wasn't sure if they're going to look for me and get mad that it wasn't me uh, that was hurt. After hitting SOS, I then booked it back down to this guy, uh, Mr. Randolph, I found out later and could not get him to respond anymore. I tried to give him some water, which at this point had already been running a little, a little bit low. Um, and then as I'm trying to talk to him and just figure out how the heck he got there, um, there was some rustling in the bushes behind me. There's a little sagebrush to the right there. And about two days prior to that, uh, I actually heard a mountain lion growling just outside my tent. So I started thinking that there was another predator nearby. But out pops this little Shih Tzu um, that I found out later is named Buddy, and it's just dying for water. So anytime I try to give this fellow some water, the dog would just try to get in there too. Um, after a short bit, I started to figure out like, okay, what can I do to help this guy? I don't know if he's just severely dehydrated. He's red, he's sunburned. He's still not responding, but he's moving every once in a while and rolling over. Uh, I decided to try to set up my tent and then give him some sort of shade, even though I don't want him in the tent. I just wanted to try to cast some shade, but being midday, you can see from the shadow, it was just coming straight down. I really couldn't get this guy in the shade at all. And a few minutes after setting up my tent and probably about maybe an hour after hitting the SOS, I started seeing dust in the distance again. And in this case, it was an ambulance with an EMT crew. Uh, as they pulled up, I quickly tore down my tent and tossed it to the side. We got him on a gurney, got him into the, uh, you know, I told him that it wasn't me that needed the SOS. It was actually this guy. Um, we, as we got him into the ambulance, you know, I gave him all information I could, that I gave him some water. There's no information if he was diabetic or not, um, and that he had not been responding the, the entire time I was with him. Uh, they took him and the dog back to Lakeview, uh, and then... As they drove off, uh, I waited for the sheriff to show up, uh, who was also on his way. Packed up the rest of my gear, uh, had some lunch, and you know, a few minutes later, the, the sheriff showed up. I gave him my information. 
we talked about, um, you know, where he might have come from. Uh, there was no signs of foul play. But the weird thing that really threw me off was that he had a pillowcase with a pistol in it, uh, which I just found was a very strange way to be carrying a firearm. Uh, so then he took off to go north and look for this guy's vehicle, or if there was one. I got back on the bike and started riding again. Later on that day, uh, as I finally get into the, uh, the Heart Mountain area, uh, I finally get cell phone signal and a flurry of texts from my partner and friends who got my SOS and were wondering if I was okay. Uh, a few phone calls later and settling everyone's nerves, I just continued on my way and finished my bike ride the next day. Um, got home su uh, Saturday afternoon, started washing my bike. You know, I got a call from the sheriff that this fellow was in the hospital and still alive and doing okay. He did indeed have diabetes and was under severe dehydration. Uh, there's a whole thing about his story on, online. And then Monday morning, I started getting phone calls from the news media, which dealing with the media and all the stories around it from around the world was probably far more stressful than this whole ordeal was. But um, since then, um, I've gone on a few other short bikepacking trips, but uh, can't wait to get back out to the Steens Mountain area. Back to you, Renee. Thanks. Those are both very intense such situations. Um, thank you for sharing. I, I wanted to talk for a few minutes about what is happening on the search and rescue side from when you press that button or you make that, that cell phone um, text, Stacy and Tomas. Um, and Stacey, I know you have experience with search and rescue. Can you take us through like what's happening uh, behind the scenes when an accident happens and you call for help? What's going on? So I think it's important for people to know and to understand, sorry, some background noise, to know and to understand that um, rescue is not immediate. Rescue can be hours at the very least and days away, depending on where you're at, um, what, how complex the area is for you to get into. Um, the first thing that happens, has to happen is somebody has to know that you're hurt. And once they know that you're hurt, um, every state has a little different overseer of um, who manages search and rescue. Um, so in Colorado, for example, it is the sheriff's department that does it. In, um, in Oregon, it is also the sheriff's department, if I understand correctly. In Mallard County, there are three search and rescue gentlemen out there. Um, so once these guys know, um, or what the search and rescue team knows that somebody is hurt, the first thing that they do is they send out what's called a hasty team. Now, spot devices, in-reach devices have changed quite a bit over the years. Um, some of the older spots, what happens is it says there's an accident, there's an emergency, but nobody knows on the other end what that emergency is. So somebody's coming to you with absolutely no information. Some of the newer versions allow you to text back and forth um, or use your Bluetooth with your cell phone so that you can give considerably more information about what the injury is, what the problem is, and then they can be more prepared as they get to you. But what happens first is a hasty team comes to you um, generally and they assess the situation. And what's happening behind the hasty team is now you have volunteers. These are people that are giving their free time, their effort, their knowledge and their skills to come out and get you and rescue you in uh, whatever scenario uh, you are placed at that time. Most of these people are volunteer based. Um, we have talked for a long time in the outdoor and the recreation community that you always tell somebody where you're going and when you're going to be back. Um, and that works. It 100% works. But the next thing that you need to know is whoever is that person that you have told that you will be back. For instance, I am going to be home at 5 o'clock. You need to know if they're the type of person that says at 5.01, they're going to panic and they're going to call the sheriff's department or they're not going to worry about you until nine o'clock at night. Because again, taking in consideration that these are search and rescue and these are volunteers, if you're just running a little bit late, 
you want to be able to know how to stop the process. But at the same time, if you know that they're not going to worry until 9 o'clock, you have four more hours in which you are maybe hurt or injured or incapacitated in some way that you're going to have to manage that emotion as well, knowing that nobody's even beginning to look for you for or even know that you're not where you're supposed to be for another four hours. So behind the scenes, volunteers, everybody getting together everything that they can, then they come to you, assess you, and start moving through the process. It is going to be the sheriff's department, if they're who is overseeing the search and rescue, that has the final determination of how you are taken out and where you are taking to. And this includes helicopter rides as well. Thank you, Stacey. Um, just to reiterate, in, in preparing for this presentation, I did speak to a veteran search and rescue volunteer about, about this issue, and he wanted to really stress the fact for all of us when we're recreating to know, just what Stacey said, your search and rescue crew might be all volunteers, and that might mean a huge variety of skills, training, and abilities. And for example, by pressing spot without being able to qualify what the injury is, they're not sure what they're responding to you with. It could be an ATV, it could be hiking in, it could be a helicopter. So there's a lot of, of variety for how that response will look. And also that response time can vary drastically. It sounds like Tomas, you had a fairly quick experience and Stacy, you had to self-rescue for hours before um, you were even able to get something out. Um, so that's really important to know um, and keep in mind when that unfortunate accident happens. Um, so next I wanna move on uh, with a few questions for both of you. Um, so before you even went on your trip, what did you do to prepare with your safety in mind? And um, either one of you, feel free to jump in if, if you have something to share. Uh, for me, it was uh, a lot of weekends of just doing overnighters in nearby campgrounds to get myself familiar with all my gear and you know how to take care of it. Um, I, actually, uh, I had actually taken classes on how to use map and compass. I, I volunteered with the local search and rescue group for a year and had some training through that. Um, but for, for me, I think the big thing for this particular situation was knowing how to assess my risk to keep myself safe and having, having that spot tracker uh, knowing that I would not have cell signal. Um, so having that spot tracker as like a bit of insurance, I think was uh, my number one preparation. How about you, Stacey? You know, for any trip, one of your uh, greatest responsibilities is to make sure that you are physically able and capable of doing the excursion that you're seeking to, to do. If you're not, if you think that you have an inkling that you're not prepared and capable, then you need to postpone it. You need to find another option. Um, it, there's no reason to take that particular risk because you are not physically ready. But in addition to that, for this trip, um, I really poured over the maps. I looked in detail over uh, what the guidebook description was telling me. I had a general overview of where I thought I would get to on any given day. I planned my average mileage. I packed food that was going to be healthy, nutritious, and filling, and that would be sufficient food even if I didn't have a lot of water because there is not a lot of water accessibility out here in places. Um, I, I changed my safety protocol uh, with, for this particular trip. I added an orange trash bag, which just seems um, so weird in retrospect. But this is something that I have taught clients for years. You can buy this big orange trash bag. It's a body bag of sorts, but it's bright. It can be seen. It can be used as, as a tarp. I added that to my, um, my stack of stuff that went with me. I really fine-tuned how much weight was going to be in my pack. And, uh, and in addition to that, I made sure I have cousins in Boise, Idaho, 
And I called them and asked them specifically if they would be my emergency contact. And that's something that you often tend just kind of run through the paces of because you just don't ever think that you need it. Um, but, you know, it was a serious conversation in case something happens. So I wanted to cover all of the bases of what the expectations were so that when I got out here, I could focus on the hike. Um, but knowing that those safety parameters were in place if needed. Thank you. Um, so when the actual situation happened, Stacey, when you realized your knee was broken and Tomas, when you realized that was a person, not a dead cow, um, what worked and didn't work with how you responded? Like how, how did you respond and do you think that was, yeah, how did it work for you? Either one of you can go first. Um, I probably should, I, in retrospect, I probably should have tried to hit that spot tracker faster uh, as soon as I found him rather than trying to chase down what I thought was a vehicle. Uh, that was always bugged me. But at this point we're talking maybe a, a half hour difference, which I don't think at that point would have made any difference in how he turned out, but he was still alive and uh, you know, doing okay. You know, for me, um, you know, the Oregon Desert Trail is, it's remote. And that's what brings a lot of us out there is that we want that remoteness. We want that solitude. And all that time that I'd been out there, I actually only saw two guys on, cow on, on horseback uh, moving some cattle. So when my knee hit that rock, the first thing that came to my mind was, oh, shit, this is going to be a long two days. And I knew that instantly because what I knew is that I was three miles from the road, and all I had to do was get to the road. But it was going to be upon me and me only to get myself there. So I knew that it was going to take time and that I needed to be patient and be making the right decisions. And, and I don't wanna to jump too far ahead here, so stop me if you need me to, but you know, I, I had to move myself out of this wet marshy stuff. Um, I had to move myself so that I could actually splint my leg. I went through every single piece of gear and equipment that was in my pack and I left a stack by the edge of the river of stuff that was not going with me because it couldn't all go. I couldn't get it all there. Um, so for instance, I didn't have a lot of food. I don't need the stove and the fuel bottle. Um, I was in five finger shoes. My boots stayed, but I needed the shoelaces. And I, out of all the years of teaching first aid and wilderness first aid to people, all of these things that I've been telling people for years, they worked. Um, I can tell you I was not using my sleeping bag as the fluff for my splint, which is what we teach people all the time, right? You use the big fluffy stuff like sleeping bags. I wasn't going to use that because I expected to be up another night and, I'm, and the desert gets cold and I'm going to need it. I couldn't use my tent poles as a part of my splint because the tent had to go with me because it may be my only protection from the sun or from the cold or for what would happen would be a hellacious storm at the top of the mesa. So at the base, I made every single one of those decisions of what stays and what goes. And then I started moving myself upward. Um, the one thing that I do find a little laughable and it's back several slides for you now but when the first time I gave a, this presentation or a similar presentation, I actually stopped because I realized that my split looks completely wrong. Um, by the time I got to the Mesa top, my split had moved all over the place. But here's what I can tell you. This is how I got to the top of the Mesa. I would take my splinted left leg and I would physically pick it up move it to the left, slide my butt to the left, grab my backpack and pull. Move my left leg, slide my butt, pull my pack. And I did this for five hours. I couldn't go downhill. 
I could only go sideways. So what you notice with the splint is that I used a thermarest. This was a brand new thermarest before I walked out the door. I used my shoelaces from my boots, but over time the splint had slid down. Well, the thermarest isn't holding air by this point either. And I actually used my hiking poles and that's the foundation of the split. And that's what got me to the top of the Mesa. Yeah, that took a lot to, <laughs> to manage that. Um, thank you both for, for going more into more detail with that. Um, so both of you sort of mentioned some of these tips. And again, I wanna reiterate um, when you're considering how to assess your risk and mitigate consequences before you leave home, it's these, these things that both Stacey and Tomas have touched on. Do your research. Um, pouring over the maps of the Oregon Desert Trail, really, you know, Tomas had been to some of those areas before, like really understanding the environment, all of the hazards, the lack of water or whatever, like do your research. You almost can't do enough research sometimes. And then assess your skills, like Stacey mentioned. And if you don't have those skills, acquire those skills. So that could be the activity you're doing, whether it's biking or hiking, climbing. It could be first aid training. Do you, would you know how to splint your knee? Like Stacey had to. Um, and so this particular trip you're doing really should not be the first time you're ever doing a certain activity. Um, and that goes into the gear and equipment as well. Like, do you have and know how to use your gear and equipment before you leave home? I think that's really important. And in a few minutes, we'll talk about some of what that gear is and go into more detail about before you go things to, to think about. Um, so Stacey or Tomas, do you wanna expand on either of these, these three points? Uh, I think being able to like, uh, know how to use your gear well, and navigate um, is kind of the big thing that I see with a lot of cyclists. Uh, years ago, I used to lead some uh, camping overnights to for other cyclists. And the problem I always saw were that people didn't know how to change, how to do something simple uh, that could end their trip, like fix a flat tire. Uh, it just seemed like such a basic thing that everyone should know, especially if you're riding a bike. Um, but um, I think just like knowing how to use your gear, having a general lay of the land. I read so many reports about this route I was doing and looked at so many photos um, that I, I knew exactly what I was getting into. Uh, there were really, other than like some sand, there really wasn't any surprises. Um, and like I said, from years of just trying out overnighters, uh, doing shorter trips, you know, in, around Portland or around the Steens Mountain area, uh, as well as volunteering and taking um, wilderness first aid classes, uh, really gave me the confidence that if something did happen, that I could probably get my way out of it. Great. Yeah, I'll, and now, I'll piggyback yeah. on that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I was just going to piggyback on the importance of taking some first aid classes uh, and just having that a uh, little bit of confidence when you go out there for what you can do in the event of emergency. And the other thing is to really and truly know how to use your gear, like how do you actually put up your tent in less than three minutes when there's a thunderstorm coming in? Um, how do you make sure that it's taunt and tight? How do you use your stove? How much time it really takes to cook your meals? Uh, those things are what ensures that you have a more comfortable um, experience and a, a safer experience. Yeah, exactly. Um, so going into the decision-making process, once an accident happens, um, and a lot of this was, has already been mentioned, but as especially Stacy has um, mentioned, never count on anyone else to rescue you. Like you have to make efforts to get yourself out, even if you do hit the spot button, because we'll, we'll touch on this later, but those devices can also have, have problems. And what um, Tomas, you hadn't mentioned, what I read was that this gentleman that you found had 
um, his car, he, he got his car stuck and he knew that no one would probably find him where he was so that he made an effort to walk out to the nearest road where he thought it would be more likely that someone would find him and, and it worked like he did. So you have to make an effort to rescue yourself. And then next is asking yourself with that is like, so what can you do? What can you do um, in that instance to help save yourself? And in both of those cases, it was move closer to, to where others may be able to, to help out. And then from there, what is the biggest danger? Like, what are you encountering? What is the biggest danger? It may be something that, that you encounter before you get to, to assistance. So this kind of ties into the next point of the rule of threes. So um, the rule of threes means you can last without these things, um, an attitude, a good attitude, three seconds. Turns out this is the biggest detriment to people. If they don't believe that they can get themselves out, if they give up, this will kill you faster than anything else. Whoops. So having a good attitude is like the most important thing. So you can last without a good attitude for three seconds. You can last without oxygen for three minutes. You can last without good thermal regulation, keeping your core warm and your body temperature warm for three hours water three days and food three weeks. So you look at, say it's snowing outside, you know, what's the greater danger, keeping your core warm or can you breathe? Are you getting next oxygen? So this is sort of like, as you're deciding, you know, what needs to happen first, keeping these things in mind. Um, so I wanna turn it back over to Stacy or Tomas, do you want to comment on your experience related to the rule of threes? Or Stacy, you probably have encountered this not only with your own experience, but on your search and rescue experience. Yeah, uh, I, I want to talk a little bit about attitude because I think it is the most important component of anytime you go in the backcountry, because again, if we all understand that anytime you go outside like this, you cannot come home, I think that's an important thing to remember. But what you have to do when you get out there is you really and truly have to decide, I want to live, and this is going to be the steps and the processes that I am going to take. And you make a decision. You make a decision at the moment something bad happens to make another decision, which is I can get through this. And then from there, you start making um, a plan, an attack. Now, you can change the plan, and you can change the attack as you need to because there's going to be a lot of forks along the way. But you have to decide that you really, really want to get out of this situation and you want to get yourself home. And one way that I do this and recommend this with my clients over all the years is before you even leave home, you sit down and you write what we call the what if statement. So the question is, what if this were to happen? And then you follow it up with, this is how I'm going to respond. By doing that at home, if that what if were to happen in the back country, you're not thinking about it for the first time. You've actually walked yourself through the process. You've come up with a strategy and a plan. And from there, you can continue to move forward. Yeah, I think the attitude and the what ifs uh, were huge. Um, you know, going on any sort of like backcountry trip like this where you're relying on your own power to walk or ride a bike, you know, bad attitude is going to sink your trip. You're going to feel horrible and not have any fun. Uh, and if something does happen, you're going to lose your cool, make bad decisions, and probably get yourself into worse trouble. The, um, you know, the, the what ifs, um, you know, anytime I look at a route, uh, especially something this large, I, I look at other roads that intersect it or any towns that I go nearby. So if something does happen, I can at least get to where other people are and get help. Uh, you know, when I ride my bike, I constantly go through scenarios in my head, like if such and such breaks on my bike, how can I fix it? How can I get the bike limping again to, to wheel myself out of there until I can make a, re a proper repair? Uh, it's one of the reasons why I carry, you know, so many tools on my bike, um, you know, like, like other than like multi-tools, I have 
uh, latex to refill my tires if I get a bad puncture. I actually have a thread and needle kit that if I slash a tire that it can't be you know healed by the latex, I can actually sew it back together and get myself going again. Um, but I think that that attitude thing is that's going to get you out of a lot of stuff, um, no matter how hard it is. Yeah, thank you both. Very good, very good points. Um, so now I, I want to move on to some practical safety tips for you all to consider. And um, we'll get into some of, of what we've maybe touched on before. And please, um, again, Stacey and Tomas, jump in if you want to expand on any of these. So at the heart of, of all of this, um, if many of you are familiar with Leave No Trace, the rule number one or principle number one is plan ahead and prepare. And really can't stress enough how important this is in a variety of areas um, before you head out. And some of those, those planning ahead and preparing um, items come in the form of uh, weather. So this is a really easy one to do, check the weather before you go. Um, and when you're on a longer trip, that can be more challenging. I actually use an in-reach. I was on a several day backpacking trip just this last weekend without cell service and I knew weather was coming in. I used the in-reach to get the weather forecast and I saw there was snow and rain almost all day. So I decided not to go up to 9,000 feet that day and instead wait. So checking the weather before you go or while you're out there is very, very um, important. And then you can carry the appropriate gear to deal with whatever weather you might encounter. Um, so with that, the season. So we're gonna talk specifically about the high desert, but there are challenges to be found in every season out there. So spring in the high desert, cold temperatures, it can snow throughout most, actually it can snow any time of year in the high desert, but spring will often have snowstorms, flooding rivers. So this is the Owyhee River and it is a part of the Oregon Desert Trail. Uh, crossing a flooding river in the spring it can be very dangerous. Um, so that may be a factor you decide, I'm gonna go in a different season when this might not be a risk. And traveling on snow in snow in spring is definitely possible. So summer, some of your challenges are very hot temperatures. We have three digit temperatures often in the summer in the high desert. And then fire danger is extremely high. We had um, the bootleg fire, one of the largest fires in Oregon, um, start in June, early June this year, and fire danger lasted through the end of September. So um, that's a very big consideration. But if you are out in the summertime, some tips are to hike early or late in the day. Um, often when I'm out in those temperatures, I might take a nap or a siesta during the day and then get up sometimes before dawn or hike into the night when the temperatures are cooler. And so um, some considerations in the fall, less water availability, which is a real concern in the high desert. Um, still fire danger, like I said, it's, it's lasted quite a long time this year and you're getting back into cold temperatures. In fact, we have a couple hikers on the Oregon Desert Trail right now. They just hiked up Steens Mountain yesterday and we're in a whiteout blizzard on Steens Mountain. Um, so the next plan ahead to prepare is gear. So carry the proper gear to deal with the worst case scenario. So again, we're gonna say this uh, over and over, but know how to the year, use the gear before you leave home. Um, there's a, there's a saying in the long distance hiking community that you carry your fears. So these are extra things you throw in your pack because you're worried about going thirsty or going hungry. Those are two of mine, <laughs> running out of food or water. Um, that's not a bad thing. I think it's it's hedging your bets. It's if you're, you're worried about um, something, you should probably, you know, pay attention to that and it's okay to carry extra things. In fact, in some of these environments, we encourage it. Um, but in a few gear tips for you, as you are in the high desert um, hiking, especially tall gators. So especially when you're hiking off of a trail in 
uh, for those of you who have done a lot in Eastern Oregon, you'll know there's not a lot of trail. Um, so wearing tall gaiters will help prevent your, your legs from getting torn up by the sagebrush and the, and the prickly bushes. Um, and they can also uh, slow down snakes. Of course, uh, you don't want to have any encounters with rattlesnakes. I'm gonna skip down to the third uh, tip is using hiking poles. So when I'm hiking through tall grasses, I use my, my poles and rustle the grass in front of me. I'm trying to give the snakes a chance to move away. We, neither of us, the snakes don't want to have an encounter with you as much as you don't want to. So giving, giving the snakes a chance to move away and those hiking poles really help with your sense of balance. Um, there's a lot of, of uneven terrain, even if it looks flat, jagged lava rock. Um, and so the hiking poles will really help you maintain your balance and shade. So there are often places in the high desert with no trees, no shade at all. So carrying something like a sun umbrella will really help um, keep you protected from the sun. And, and so the sun is definitely a risk out there and getting too much sun exposure can be um, a real hazard. So with gear, now this is a system some of you probably heard about. The 10 Essentials uh, was originally something that uh, a group called the Mountaineers came up with. And this, this is really used to help you answer two basic questions. First, can you respond positively to an accident or emergency? Do you have things with you to help you respond? And second, can you safely spend a night or more out? So this is important even on a day hike. Again, things can happen um, even uh, close to home or when you're not expecting it on a day hike. So the list has actually evolved from individual items to systems. So please look this up after, after the event. Well, I believe we'll send a link out with some more information about the 10 essentials. But with you, think about and carry items related to navigation, sun protection, insulation, illumination, your first aid supplies, um, a way to start a fire, uh, a repair kit and tools, nutrition, hydration, and a shelter. And now this will look different for all of you depending on um, where you're going. And again, those other items like checking the weather, where are you going during your research? But these are things to think about before you leave home. Next, we're gonna get into food and water. So much like I said, I carry my fears of too much food and water. It's okay. It's probably a good idea to carry a little bit more food and water, especially in the high desert. So a lot of the elevations you'll encounter when you're recreating are between four and 10,000 feet. So it's much higher um, than some of you may have regular experience with if you live in the Willamette Valley, for example. Um, and it's a dry desert, so you will, um, you will be thirstier and need more water for a mile hiking in the high desert than you would in, in a more temperate um, part of, of the state. Uh, with that, it's really important to have electrolytes. Now, these are salts and sugars, so eating frequently, having salts and sugars, because that will help your body retain the water you're drinking. Um, there is a condition where if you don't have enough salts and sugars, your butt, you'll drink, you'll drink water, you'll keep drinking, and you'll just pass it, and you your body won't get the benefits of of the hydration. And it's super important to have a good water purification system, maybe more than one. So when I hiked the Oregon Desert Trail, I had a filter. I would often pre-filter through a shirt to get the chunks out use a water filter and then a chemical purification. Sometimes the water you're using out there is, is also used by cattle and, and other wildlife and it um, is probably contaminated with something. So having a good water for purification system is really important. Fitness. So this was also touched on already, um, but pace yourself out there. You know, not every mile is created equal. If you are hiking, again, extreme elevations, uneven terrain through the canyon, up and down, crossing a river, um, this is gonna take extra time. And so, um, especially without a trail and navigation takes time. 
looking at your maps, consulting your GPS device, all of the things that it takes to, um, to hike in this terrain uh, and to stay on your route takes time. So build in some extra time and pace yourself. Um, and I already mentioned the high elevations, but there are also long water carries. So between some reliable sources, um, same with Tomas on his bike trip, um, was running low on water when, when he encountered the gentleman on the road. So um, carrying water is a real concern and making sure you have enough capacity to carry extra water is super important. Now on the communication side, um, this, is, this is some of what Stacy touched on is having someone at home, a friend or family member, have information about what you're up to. So it helps to include your timetable. When do you expect to be back? What is, when are you gonna reach the next uh, resupply spot? The location of your journey, um, is it a trail or a route? Where is it going? Leave a map with someone. Um, if you are in a vehicle, what's your vehicle description and your plate number? What is the gear that you'll have? Um, and that's important. Like Cece said, she had this large orange bag and that was that's, that can be a great beacon. If there is an air uh, search for you, you have something you can help um, notify people where you are. Cell phone number, are you carrying a cell phone? Is there service? Is there a carrier? That's important. Um, Verizon has a lot of service in the high desert. A lot of other carriers do not. So knowing what cell service, uh, cell carrier you have will, is important to your, um, your person at home that you're leaving all this information with. Then we have, are you going with someone? So if you are traveling with someone, who is that person? What is their name? and their information, who is their emergency contact, um, the description of your tent and outer clothing. Like, Stacy, we saw you had a red tent. That was probably very helpful, like a big red tent. Um, so your person at home can tell search and rescue, this person is in a big red tent. She's, she's wearing a red jacket or whatever it is. They have a description of you. And um, like I said before, a copy of the map of where you're going. I um, already mentioned this, but knowing that cell service is spotty, um, Verizon works great, not really in the Hawaii region, but knowing that and preparing. So if you're deciding to spend two, three months in Eastern Oregon, maybe change carriers or, or choose a different kind of communication device. Um, and those we'll get into, we've mentioned both of these, the in-reach device and the spot device. So consider carrying a satellite beacon, but again, um, know that you can't count on anyone else to save you. You know you can press that button, but you need to make an effort to, to self-rescue um, and know that that's part of your plan. And know that those devices have flaws, like they can break as well, any technology. So just, it's not the one hundred percent, you know, you're, you're golden. Um, just, it's good things to keep in mind. And again, um, knowing these remote locations help can be a long time away. So take that into consideration and, um, and the time and effort. So when you do hit the call button, you know, help could come on horseback on in a helicopter with an ATV with a litter. So um, there's a lot of a lot of uh, different scenarios you might encounter as someone comes out to rescue you. Um, so something like the inReach device, the yellow device does allow text messages so you can actually qualify and communicate. Um, so that's that's I think one benefit of, of carrying an inReach device is you can actually qualify your emergency and communicate back and forth. Um, so what do you provide someone, what do you provide search and rescue when you call or ask for help, if you have the ability to do that? Um, so identify yourself and identify specifically as you can where you believe you are. So a lot of the, the satellite location devices will give a waypoint of where you are, but like in Stacey's instance, she was moving. So, you know, if you have the ability, you can say I'm here, but I'm moving towards this location. Um, the nature of your emergency, is it 
Is it an injury, a broken knee? Is it, you know, uh, allergic reaction? If you have, if you can explain what the emergency is, that will make sure they're coming to you with the right equipment and training and volunteers to respond to, to the emergency um, and be as specific as possible when you're communicating. And just remember, it might be hours before someone um, does come out. So I know that was a lot of information, but Stacey and Tomas, anything you want to add or emphasize in some of those, those planning ahead and preparing tips? Um, so, the, uh, so like the spot tracker and the in reach and whatnot, they can, there's a bit of sticker shock to those. Like they are, they're not cheap, um, but apparently you can rent them through companies like Mountain Shop and REI. Uh, or if you have a friend that has one, you can loan them out and uh, have it registered in, you know, your friend's name. So that when they hit SOS, they're looking for your friend and not you. Uh, because, you know, it's going to be kind of weird when you're in the middle of the forest and you hear your friend's name getting shouted instead of your name uh, when they're actually looking for you. Um, but be prepared to spend a few bucks uh, on any of those satellite trackers. The only thing that I'm going to add is before you walk out the door, Take your boot or your shoe, whatever you're wearing, and um, paint the bottom of it and put it as a marker on a piece of paper. Because if you're lost out there and they're looking for you, it helps a lot when they can actually track exactly your shoe or know what they're looking for instead of just a random, and they can also help uh, track and time that. That is a new one. Thank, I learned something tonight. Thank you, Stacey. Yeah, that's a really good tip. Um, well, thank everyone for, for attending tonight. We are going to um, get into some question and answer. I know it's it's been about an hour, so I just wanted to make sure if any of you need to, to take off that um, we really appreciate you attending and hopefully we can all go out a little more prepared um, and ready for the next backcountry adventure in Eastern Oregon or beyond. Um, so now we're gonna go to the Q&A portion of, of the talk. I know I've, I've seen a few questions